Okay, so let's get started. We just hit our time here. Um, I'm gonna turn off my video because there's no need for that. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Don Labar. I'm the Special Collections Librarian for the uh, George R. and Edith Angel Cook Special Collections Department. That's me. Um, this is my contact information, um, both email and phone number. Um, if you ever have any questions um, that we don't answer today or general history questions or maritime questions or, you know, maybe some genealogical questions or what have you, uh, you can contact me at this or any of my colleagues that work with me as well. Um, there's there's three of us total and you can basically contact us and we can help you out. So if you wanted slides or what have you, or you're doing a digitization project and you're really stumped or not really sure how to approach it, I'm kind of your guy. So um please feel free to reach out and uh, touch base. Always have to talk about this stuff. Um, so for today's program, um, hoping to kind of keep it uh, quick and clean. I'll take questions because it's kind of a smaller group today. I don't mind taking questions during, just kind of blurt it out. Don't, don't be afraid to kind of interrupt me. Um, so we're gonna be talking about a couple things today, um, kind of running the span. My hope is that this program is a little bit more on the introductory beginner level, I don't want to hit you with some really heavy stuff um, because I find I can answer the heavy stuff for you when you get to the heavy stuff. Um, so we're going to be talking about the differences between doing it yourself or maybe paying a vendor, um, you know, what you kind of need to take into account. Um, you know, do you take a digitize it all approach? Do you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photos and you're not really sure how to approach that? Um, are you thinking about scanning them? Are you thinking about using a camera? Um, and then also talking about some of them, a little bit more of an introduction into the nitty gritty of resolution, bit depth, color, um, and then a little bit of file structure kind of after you digitize, what do you do with it then, you know? So before we jump into all that, I do want to bring this up because I do get asked it quite a bit. Um, in terms of copyright, so if you are digitizing your own family materials, um, this doesn't apply as much, but sometimes I do get people that are digitizing uh, materials that their parents or family members collected um, that are not theirs. They're not the creator. Maybe they got it because uh, they went on vacation to Cancun and they got a photo taken or they bought a photo from an art gallery and they want to digitize it. Or there's an artwork that was done by someone that they bought from. Um, copyright's a really funky thing. And in the library world, it's a very gray area. Um, for most of you, you probably won't have to deal with it, but just think, um, let's say you have a photo, your parents bought postcards or photos or whatever, and you want to digitize it. You always want to be careful how you're putting it out there. Usually the common law questions like follow the buck. If you're making money off of it, that's where you can get maybe in trouble. But if this is something that your grandfather took photos of, or you took photos of, it's a little bit more, um, easy peasy. So, you know, you want to ask yourself, do you own it? Is it, did you take the photos? Did your dad take the photos? Is your dad still around? Your mom's still around? Um, you know, who was the original creator and when was that object created? So usually in the world of libraries, when we are, you know, people always go, oh, why can't you just digitize everything? Because we don't own the copyright to most of the stuff we have. Um, and our cutoff is 1923. So if we have to, if we have a, a massive photograph negative collection, we are usually in a, in a conversation with the donor and if the donor has the rights, the copyright rights, then we can have that conversation of, okay, we can take it in and then we can create digital reproductions of it. So a little bit different for family collections, but just something to kind of think about. There's a lot of materials out there um, that can talk about copyright. Um, but again, for most of you all in here and those that are tuning in uh, virtually in the future, um, you won't really have to worry about this too much. And if you ever have questions, I'm always happy to point you all in the right direction. <laughs> So let's talk about at-risk items first. So um, when you're looking at kind of what you need to start with first in terms of the digitization project, I usually recommend looking at your audio-visual materials being the priority for your digitization projects. Um, you know, not everyone has audio-visual materials, but for those that do have it, audio-visual, when I say that, that means DVDs, CDs, audio cassettes, Super 8s, 8 millimeters, VHS, beta tapes, um, that kind of material. The majority of these form formats have a magnetic medium or media in it, um, and that degrades over time. You cannot stop that unless you're like the Library of Michigan, 
or, or sorry, yeah, Library of Michigan, or if you're Library of Congress, um, you're, you're spending some pretty big bucks to, to preserve it. Um, you can slow the degradation. Uh, my colleague Marlo gave a presentation this last Tuesday about how to store family materials. Um, if you missed that, uh, next week on Facebook, we're going to be sharing the link to when she did that a couple of years ago. So that's there as well. Um, but again, always happy to answer preservation questions about this. Um, but for the purposes of today, we're talking more about the digitization of them. So you're really looking at these things because um, you can't view a DVD without a computer. You can't view a DVD without being able to put the DVD in the computer. Um, I have laptops. Um, the last couple laptops I have, this laptop does not have a DVD player on it. So it's becoming an aged form. Um, so if you have family videos of going to Disneyland with your kids or your grandparents or, you know, what have you, and they're on DVDs and that's how you're storing things, they are a dying medium. Um, and the longer you wait, the harder it is going to be to digitize those types of materials. It goes for CDs are the same thing. Audio cassettes, Super 8s are definitely in what we would call legacy, a legacy medium or legacy media. Um, there are equipment out there, both affordable and more expensive. Of course, in theory, the more you spend um, on equipment, the higher quality. But there is such a thing as, um, you know, shooting a little too heavy with equipment because, you know, I, you could scan to the highest level, but that's not going to fix, you know, if it's a handheld camera and it's all jumpy and it's kind of blurry because of the medium, you're never going to be able to really improve it. Now, that being said, there is equipment out there that can, using AI and software, can repair or improve. Um, that is not my forte, though, because um, that's not what we do at the library um, for our own materials. Um, but there are things out there that I've seen. Answer has a couple of different programs out, out there as well. So if you have a DVD or a CD that you've had and it's 10 years or older, it's already degrading. Like it's just it's happening. You might be still be able to play it. You might be able still to view it. But there is degradation that's happening both with the physical me medium, but also with the digital information that's on those um, DVDs and CDs and all that material as well. So that's why you really want to prioritize your audiovisual materials. Um, and when you're looking at that and you're trying to figure out, okay, I have all these cassettes and everything else and or super eights for my family members. Um, you know, you want to think about how, okay, how am I going to prioritize what I digitize first, especially if you can't digitize it all, right? You, you're like, I only have enough money to do so much or only time to do so much. Uh, you kind of want to ask yourself a couple quick questions, which are, you know, are they in poor condition or about to be, become poor? Are they, do they have a chemical smell to them? Do they, are they becoming brittle? Are they starting to break apart? Or, or when you play them, are you seeing like weird jumps and blank um, parts to it? Um, that's something that would probably give you an inclination that maybe that you should prioritize that over something that's a little bit newer. So if you have a bunch of Super 8s or um, audio cassettes um, and you just made a DVD three years ago, then maybe you want to be looking at your cassettes um, and your super eights and materials like that, that are maybe in worse condition. You also want to ask yourself, have you lost or broken the original players, right? So do you have a DVD player at home? Do you have, uh, does your computer have a DVD or CD slot that they can be used? Um, do you have a VHS player? Some VHS players come with their own recording function. Um, but if you don't have access to that anymore, um, you might have to think about buying one. And not a lot of companies are really making them new. So you're going to be buying used. So good luck. You can uh, really do your homework before you do that. Um, and then kind of the, like the final question is, um, you know, has the company, uh, let's say for a DVD or whatever, has the company started to stop making anything that reads that, right? So um, Super 8, things like that. There's no companies that are making Super 8 players. There are maybe companies out there that make specialized digitization equipment for <laughs> organizations like myself. Um, to scan them, but they're not as commercially available for everyday individuals that want to play a Super 8. So these are kind of the things you want to ask yourself. Um, and so if your answer is yes to any of these, you really want to think about potentially digitizing them. Um, you also really want to be looking at any of these types of materials that have um, a really high emotional value, right? So, you know, maybe leave the Cinderella copy of on VHS that you have on home. You don't really need to digitize that. Disney's already done it for you. Plus it's a copyright infringement. But, you know, if you have, I don't know, a, a video of your child's first baptism or their first trip to go see the grandparents on the East Coast, they have high value. Again, maybe that's something you want to look at digitizing over 
you know, like, oh, we just had a random picnic. You know, again, you, you, you're the person that's going to have that best understanding of what you have and what's going to be worth it um, and what's worth your time. Now, again, you have two of VHSs and five photos, then, you know, scan it all. But um, some of us have a lot more than others. And so sometimes you have to make a little bit of a priority shot of, you know, if, if you only have two years to do it for whatever reasons, what, what do you want to get done? What, what do you want to make sure is digitized and available to be shared to the rest of the family? Um, and this is kind of where we get into, you know, do you want to DIY it or do you want to pay someone? Do you want to pay a company to do this for you? Um, there are pros and cons to both. Um, we at the library do it all in-house for the most part. Um, and so that's why I like giving this presentation um, because I, you know, yeah, I'm professionally trained in some of this material, but a lot of this is also self-taught to a degree as well. Um, so if I can do it, you all can do it. Um, so when you're looking at DIY versus paying someone, um, if you're looking at hiring a vendor to digitize your material, um, that can actually save you a large amount of time. Digitization is a very time intensive pro uh, process. Um, if we are at the library scanning a single negative, sometimes that single scan, because we're scanning at such a high level, um, can take two minutes. So I have photo collections, I have negative collections that are in the thousands. and so. Do I want to spend two to five minutes per negative in the thousands? And so we have to make a choice. I have 40 negatives of this one event. I'm only going to scan three because you can always go back to the 40. We preserve the original material and the digitization gives us access to a selection of, from that event. Um, so those are things you kind of have to think about. Um, and this is where um, the professional can come in. If you are like, I want to digitize it all, but I am going to Florida in the, in the winter and I'm visiting family, I just don't have time. Um, then maybe, you, yeah, you look at a vendor and you, you, you weigh the cost versus the time that goes into it. Um, and digitization isn't a very expensive thing to have a vendor do, but it can add up really quick. It's very cheap to do small stuff, um, but you can very easily add on to it. Again, um, you have to make that decision of how much material do you have? How much material do you want to digitize? And is it worth it to pay someone X price or for that price, do you want to do it yourself? I always use the example of a fence. Last summer, I built a fence for my little corgi, and it was going to cost me $3,000 to bring a professional to put a, ch a chain link fence in, or I can make the mistakes, figure out how to do it myself, and save myself half the cost. I don't mind putting the time into it because I had the time. If I didn't have the time, then maybe I would have paid the extra money to have someone else do it for me. So kind of the example that we can use there. Um, you know, you also want to um, keep in mind, um, you also need to think about like the condition of the material you're working with, right? So um, do you have a super fragile family scrapbook that the moment you touch it, it just evaporates on you? Do you know what you're doing with that material? Are, do you not have the comfort to handle some of these things? Um, you know, we're professionals in our field. We're overly cautious. We're paid to be overly cautious. Um, not everyone has that style to them and that's fine. But maybe that's where you need to start thinking about maybe a vendor comes into play because they're going to know how to handle fragile materials, especially if they're hard to handle. Kind of if you have a really fragile family scrapbook that not only are the, the photos fragile, but the newspaper clippings are fragile and the bindings falling, you know, just the thing you touch it, it just kind of gets real. You might want to start thinking, OK, well, I don't know what I'm doing here. Maybe it's time to start talking to a company or a vendor type situation where they do know what they're doing. They can go, OK, yep, we know how to handle this. We can. You know, we can we can handle it very lightly and, and digitize it. And they might have access to equipment that you normally wouldn't have access to on the market um, that has less impact on the medium as they scan it. Um, so when most of us, um, maybe some of us have already looked up online options, different companies, it's a growing thing. Uh, and you look at kind of the packages um, that specialize in digitization services. Um, typically, I see uh, online um, you kind of like pick a package and then you select the package and then they tell you, okay, these are the things you can do. You could do this many photos and this many, you know, different types of materials and you pay for the package and you send it to them. They digitize it. They send you back a USB file or some kind of cloud file. You download that and then they send you back your original. So it is a pretty clean process. I, I will say, do your homework. Um, not all companies are equal. Um, you know, we can't give a specific recommendation on who to use, um, but we're always happy to, let you know like, hey, Dom, what should I be looking for? 
Um, you know, anybody could say archival. Archival is not a coded word. You don't have to be a professional to be able to say we do archival quality. Um, so just read through it, look through the process, make sure they're a reputable company or, or if it's a individual, you know, don't hesitate to ask them like, okay, so what's your experience? What's your background? What's your, you know, there's a lot of people that can digitize because it's not really that hard in the grand scope of things. Um, but there's, you know, I know vendors that come from an archival background that really know their stuff. And then I know some other people that are, you know, they're good for what they do, but they just do it because they like it, you know, they don't have a professional background in it, but they have the equipment to do it. Um, so again, um, you know, the person that has all that experience is probably going to cost more than maybe someone that doesn't have that kind of background to them. So again, you kind of have to weigh the pros and cons. Luckily for you, um, for those in the room and anybody tuning in uh, virtually in the future, uh, if you live in the area, we um, haven't made the formal announcement, but we actually have a DIY digitization station here. So we have all the equipment. Um, we haven't announced it yet, but we will we'll be announcing as part of preservation week this week. Um, and in that station is actually in the room to my left over here. It's in what's called the makerspace. If you haven't seen it, I really recommend checking out the makerspace. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. Uh, but in one of the corners is what we call a memory lab. And there uh, you can set, we could set you up with minimal training. Um, and basically you could scan negatives, photos, documents. Um, you could scan super eights, eight millimeters, uh, VHSs, audio cassettes. So we have that equipment now available to our patrons here. Um, we're still working out the kind of the complexities of it, but basically it'll probably be by appointment or by a very specific time when there's a staff person there that can help you. So um, keep on the lookout for that because probably that will be available to use within the next month or two. Um, we're really excited for it because it's something that's coming happening all across the nation. So we're very fortunate because of our endowment um, that we were able to um, financially be able to build it. So we're really, really psyched for that to happen. Um, you know, digitization can also be done at home too. Um, like I've kind of been saying a couple of times, in theory, digitization, and for the most part, is not really complicated, right? Like if you're very careful and you know how to handle things and you do your research, most people can handle digitization. If you're if you're decent with the computer uh, and you know how to do basic work with computers, you can do digitization. Now, if you struggle turning on a computer in the first place, it might be a little bit more tricky and maybe you need to think about, do you have a tech savvy sister or um, sibling or, or, you know, offspring that can help you out with it. That's nothing wrong with that. So um, again, you can kind of look at the pros and cons of that. Um, and DIY is more affordable, right? Like, cause you're doing it yourself, you're putting the work in. So if you have the time and you're like, I want to do this, this is a priority for me. Um, you can do with a little bit of research, um, get your own equipment. Um, and if you have enough material to go through, then it, it could be financially worth it to get your own equipment, do your own product. And you don't have to leave your house and you can have that. Well, I wouldn't recommend having wine or, or beer next to your material, but you know, you're in the comfort of your home. You can leave the room and have that drink if you want. Um, you know, before you start, you kind of want to take into account a couple things. Um, you really want to take a look, a uh, closer look at materials and note down materials that would most benefit from being digitized. We talked a little bit about this with the audio visual materials, um, but negatives, photographs, um, letters, correspondence type things. Um, these are things that you're really going to want to think about because um, when you're digitizing, there's a, as you digitize, you are handling material. And if it's super fragile and you make that little nick and, you know, no one, very few times have I ever heard people, someone like just grab something and destroys it. There's always just, oh, you picked it up. Oh, a slight little tear. And you picked it up again and a slight little tear. And it, it does add up over time if you're not careful. Um, and when you digitize something, the whole goal is that you're you're handling it as little as possible. You want to digitize it right the first time so you don't really have to ever go through that process again because you're taking something that's fragile and you're wedging it between two pieces of glass or what have you, you're moving it to another spot. You're exposing it to the opportunities to be um, you know, degraded. Um, so, you know, you also want to think about when you're digitizing, um, what do you want to be digitizing? You know, I've seen situations where people have like a diary, but they only digitize portions of the diary. And then five years later, they're like, I can't remember where this is from. You know, for us, we digitize the whole thing. And sometimes people go like, well, why do you scan the cover? I scan the cover because I want to know what it looks like, because it's important to know what those materials look like. 
Um, it kind of goes for the same thing with like when people scan photos that have, you know, the old fashioned photos that have the cardboard mounting on the back. At the library, we scan the whole thing. We scan a master tip to the whole thing. And if we don't want to have the mounting in, we just make a copy and we crop that out. But at the end of the day, the mounting is just as important in some ways as the photo because the mounting can give you an inclination of time period. It might be a little bit more intense than for a family collection, but it's why we do why we do it that way. Um, you know, you want to think about, you know, up here on the table, uh, this is a table that um, came from uh, Margot's notes, um, creating family archives book, which I do have here. We have it available for checkout. It's actually a really great book. I recommend it. If you're really serious about doing it and you want to go that stuff, um, this is a, a new book. So it's up to all the standards that exist pretty much within this year. So it's a, it's a great starting point that I highly recommend. Um, so these tables are from that. I have another slide that has tables from her as well. Um, I would say she, she is a little bit more intense with stuff, but if you follow her standards, you're doing a really good job. And if you fall short of her standards a little bit, then don't beat yourself up about it. Um, but you can look at the best practices for digitization. I'm not really big on reading out what's on the slide all the time, but um, you can kind of get an idea under best practices for digitization. You know, she's talking about, you want to scan at a higher resolution. Um, you can always scan high first, because if you just need to make a JPEG or something small, you can crunch that down using certain, there's a lot of open software, free open software online that you could use. Um, we use um, free open source software to do file conversion for us. It, once you get the hang of it, there's a lot of literature out there on how to do it. So you can scan a high resolution original, what we would call a master copy or a master, we call them master tips because that's what we make. Um, and you can always take a master tip and then create a lower resolution uh, digital copy from that. So if you want to share something to Facebook or whatever, you can make a lower copy. So start high, full low, because if you scan low, you can't go high. You have to rescan to do that. Um, and I've seen it happen a lot of times. Um, and we're always hesitant to take digital born objects that are done that way. Um, you know, you could also use, um, you, when you're scanning, not to get too much into the weeds of it, um, your main two options are going to be JPEGs or TIFFs, typically for an object. PDFs are a little bit more reserved for multiple things. Um, you know, technically a PDF, like you could have a PDF. A PDF is just housing for JPEGs or TIFFs. So you can do all that. Um, oh, is that walking? Is that blocking that? Um, so you, most of the time for photos or things like that corresponds, you're going to be looking at a TIFF or a JPEG most of the time. If you only have the capacity to um, scan a uh, PDF, that's fine, but just know that you're going to have potentially some data loss by doing that. Um, in terms of candidates for digitization, um, we've kind of already covered most of it, but again, if you have a really popular, uh, well-used items, I have people that come in a lot of times with the family scrapbooks that have photos and everything like that, and every cousin wants to see it, and every aunt and uncle, and everyone wants to see it, great, scan it. And then email them a PDF of it, right? Give them a, a lower resolution PDF that isn't some massive file, ship it off to them, it makes everyone happy. We're actually working on a project where we're digitizing some diaries, um, and the diaries are mainly held by one individual, and then they have siblings that hold the rest of them. And um, we're scanning all of them, and we're giving them all the PDFs as a result of that. And so because of the, the material that we're getting in is, is a really useful uh, collection that we're excited about. Um, you know, you want to think about unique one-of-a-kind collections. If your parents were really in, into collecting Texas postcards, and you have to make the option between Texas postcards. We live in Michigan. So you have to make the option between Texas postcards that have no writing on the back and family photos. Then maybe you're going to lean more towards family photos, spending that time, at least initially. Um, and then also, of course, items that are um, at risk of being lost forever because of deterioration. Again, the audio visual materials that we're talking about in the beginning. Uh, photos, um, negatives, uh, printed photos, correspondence. Base in theory, I could comfortably say it will last longer than a VHS or audio cassette tape. You know, you'll start getting a vinegar smell on it and they just start to crumple. They just don't have the shelf life by these other materials. You again, you can um, stave that a bit, but um, inevitably they're going to degrade a lot quicker than, say, a photo or what have you. So um, that's where you're going to start making your decisions um, into when you want to take into account before you get started. 
Um, so in terms of selecting which photos, um, again, time consuming process. Um, I gave the example of, we have that one collection that's literally in the thousands of negatives. So making, I would call it a sample survey, right? Like, so I'm only gonna pick two images out of the 10 because these two images show, you know, for example, we have to make a decision. Okay, I got 10 images of uh, this church being torn down. And this was a really historically important church and it got torn down for parking lot. Do I need to show all 10 photos? Well, five of the photos are just the dust cloud. I don't really need to take a photo of that. Maybe I wanna have the photo before it fell, during fall and after fall to show that progression. Or if you have something that really shows something very different, um, then maybe that's a candidate. But if you have a lot of duplication or you know people have a missed shot and they misfocused or whatever, then don't worry about it too much. You wanna go for the clean image. Um, and you can always, if you have like, if they're not organized in a very specific way and they're just scattered, you could always organize things kind of mentally or physically into like, this is the must scan folder. This is the, once I get the must down, like I can get to the eventually folder. And then you have the ones that are like, I don't need to scan this because they're duplicates or they're paper copies or, you know, whatever reason that you might have for that. Um, you know, you could be looking at when you're selecting photos, you could be looking at maybe like a photo album. You know, we would in theory um, scan the whole page because again, high resolution scan, we can rip just the photo off if we need it for publication or museum uses or, or whatever. Um, so sometimes it's nice to get the whole shot in there as well. As you're looking at photos and selecting photos, um, especially if you're dealing with negatives, you might need to start thinking about looking into what's known as a light box. I forgot to grab it, so I apologize. Um, a light box would just be it's what it sounds like. It's usually a box or it's a flat piece, usually LEDs or some, or some kind of bulb um, and a transparency on the top and you can put the negative on top of it, shines through and you can view it. Um, and then you usually have some kind of magnifier glass so you can actually really inspect what you're looking at. Um, we use it a lot because we have to make, we want to make the decision before we put it on the scanner and take the time to scan it and then realize, well, this is all fuzzy. We don't need to scan this. Um, so you might need to be thinking about using that on top of just having a scanner. Granted, some scanning equipment and the software is pretty solid. So you could do a preview and it kind of makes the light box obsolete. But if you're doing a lot of volume, it's a lot quicker to do it with a light box than it is to load it into the frame, put it into the scanner, preview the scanner, make your selections go, you know. So again, something to think about as you're, as you're approaching a project. Um, also, if you have if you have a negative, let's say your dad or your mom took photos of a vacation, you have the negatives and then you have the photos that they printed from the negatives. If you want to scan it, my recommendation is to do the negatives. And then if there's any information on the back, like, hey, this is cousin Timmy uh, and this is Ted and this is Susan and this is Jamal, like you can put that into the metadata, no problem. You're going to get a better, higher resolution scan period. Um, from the negative than you would from the printed material. So again, something to um, consider when you're looking at that. If you have both, my recommendation is always look at the negative uh, first, but again, if you only have one, then that's fine. Um, so getting into the types of scanners, uh, again, like I'm not gonna have a, a list of which scanners we're gonna use, uh, which ones I recommend, which one, you know, the exact type. Um, but you, this is where you could spend a lot of money or not a lot of money. And it really comes down to what you need it to do. Um, digitization for us, mostly when we do negatives, is done on a flatbed scanner. Uh, something like the what's on the far left of the screen. Um, that's actually the type that we use. Um, it's an Epson. Um, these are a lot more expensive than the one in the middle and the one on the right. Um, because they do a lot more for us um, and we're able to afford it through grants and funding and donations. Um, so that might not be an option for everyone, but there are more affordable flatbed scanners out there that you can use. Um, you just kind of want to pay attention to what they're capable of doing. Um, and, you know, with other types of scanners, so you have like the document feeder, oh, really avoid those. Um, you know, let's say you have a bunch of letters from, your grandparents or your mom and your dad from a conflict overseas and they're sending them back home or, you know, vacation, whatever. Um, and they're on just a normal size piece of paper. Um, 
resist the urge to run it through the document feeder because you can put that in and think, oh, it's going to totally work. This paper's totally fine. It's not fragile. And those rollers get it and it just crunches and you just potentially irreparably uh, ruined it. So again, flatbeds are really good options. Um, we at the library have used roller-based scanners before, but we use them very sparingly. We know how to use them. We have certain housing that we put them in to do it. And we only do them to very, very specific things that we know. Worst case scenario, if this does go through and it doesn't, something bad happens, we're not like, we ruin something history forever. We don't throw the constitution through the thing, okay? Um, but maybe if we know we have a copy from another organization that we just wanna scan for our patron, then we have no problem with that. So, um, you know, there are other types of scanners out there. There's the flatbeds, there's the document feeder types. Um, I've seen in my research career, I've seen um, scanning types that it's almost like a wand that you could hold over, or they could be like that, the one in the middle is you feed it in and it feeds through flat and goes through. Um, again, I would avoid anything that feeds into and has to go through. Um, I've seen the wand type ones that scan over the top. Those are fine, but those are meant I've seen them more used as like a research tool of like, I'm going to the Library of Congress to do this research and I just need to get through materials quick. These days, you know, that was five, six years ago. These days, most people's phones have like PDF scanners on them. And if that's the only option you can do, then my recommendation, just use your iPhone, scan the PDF. Like there's some pretty nice software out there that's for free. And if you really want it to be really nice, you can pay not that expensive for it too. So you have the options. It just really comes down to what do you want it to be? Um, not everyone needs to do super intense digitization work and they just want to scan something really quick. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as it gets, you know, if you want to share it with the cousins and the family members and that's what gets it done, then by all means go for it. Um, you do want to think about, you know, going back into the, the flatbed scanner world. Um, you know, there's different ways to scan more so when you start looking into negatives, um, you want a scanner that can handle that. And usually why? Because some flatbed scanners, the top is just the top. There's nothing on it. Um, flatbed scanners that can handle negatives, typically there's two light sources. There's a scanning beam and then on top, there's usually a light that flashes through. And then usually um, your hold, you'll have those um, scanners will usually come with some kind of like framework. And so this is a, this is a 35 millimeter slide and you can see where this goes in. And then you would place it into a slot on the scanner, close the bed, slide on top, scan on the bottom, and hold all the place and so that's the software plane. So it's the software to hold it perfectly because it's really fast. So for those um, that are attending virtually eventually, um, you know, we were just talking about we have a slide um, frame that we have here. Um, Scanners that specialize in photo scanning, especially negative scanning, will typically come with these and then they'll have software available to scan those materials. It makes the process a lot faster than holding it by hand or placing it by hand costly. You know, this one alone could do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, twelve, thirty-five millimeter slides. I have other ones that could do full strips. Um, so I could cook through twenty to thirty photos per slide, and the frames hold it perfectly so the software can read it, gives you a thumbnail. You can go click, click. I don't want these five. I want these 20 or whatever. Press scan, it'll auto scan through them. So some systems are better. Um, that's why I kind of go, you could have a really amazing scanner and the software could be absolutely horrible and ruin the experience for you. You want something like a really, has a really good software on top of it and not just a really nice expensive piece of equipment. Typically, the more you pay, the software might be a lot more nuanced and more intelligent, but that's not always the case. Yeah. For, for a scanner, now, for scanning the negative, what's the a reasonable price that you can pay for that type of scanner? It, so if I were to be, if I were to buy something to scan um, at home negatives, I've seen people pull off some pretty incredible stuff anywhere between like 300 and a thousand. So I, I would probably argue, you know, I have a I have a printer and scanner at home that was a hundred dollars at the time, and I can scan JPEGs on it just fine. It works. It's nothing crazy. Um, 
So, you know, you really can tailor it to your budget. Um, the moment you start going over the four digits, I'd probably start asking you, do you really need to go that high? Um, and maybe do, there's so many resources online and so many people talking about this kind of stuff that you could pretty quickly find what people prefer in terms of equipment type. Um, but yeah, I'd probably say you could probably get away with anything pretty solid between 300 and a thousand. I've had people that scan stuff on their own that have more expensive, but again, everyone has their own budget and it just depends how much you, how much you really want to put towards it. At the end of the day, you really want to be more conscious of the quality of the file it's making over the price. Cause you might have something that's a little bit more expensive. Well, why is that different than something that's a little cheaper? It might be because it has a, a better resolution range. It can do different file types. It can do more nuanced color types, bit rates, which we'll talk about in a second here. Um, so you just kind of the, balance that. Yeah, so that's a great question. I do have a slide that we'll talk about that. So I, we'll jump a couple more here and then I'll we'll get into the tip question for you. And yes, that, that's a, there's a valid reason for that. Um, some people um, use cameras. They don't use scanners. I have some colleagues of mine that uh, they are maritime enthusiasts and they go to archives and the guy has a custom, custom, he did build it himself, but he built this custom little setup. The camera clicks on the top, he shoots down it and it works great. Um, it, cameras can work. I would recommend though, if you're not tech savvy and you don't want to put that much homework, this is a lot more intense than buying a flatbed scanner. Why you might go with this option, if you have a lot of material, let's say, I don't know, let's say you, your grandparents were um, very accomplished artists and you want to digitally preserve their work um, because you have all your cousins want the artwork, but only one cousin owns it and you just want to share it so they can print it out on a high quality graphic print or, or, or what have you. This might be more of an option because in theory you could shoot a lot larger, most flatbed scanners that are in the affordable range for what I would say is the everyday consumer, um, they're going to shoot to legal size. So like eight, eight and a half to 14 inches. Once you start getting larger than that, prices go way up really quick. Um, so sometimes it can be cheaper to have a camera, a, a DSLR or a mirrorless or something like that. Uh, most of those, most of those cameras can shoot in both TIFF, JPEG, all that stuff, but you're dealing with a lot more factors, a lot more moving parts, and you need to have a little bit more tech savvy to you to do it. But again, there's a lot of resources online. Um, I used to set up these systems. So if any of you have questions and that's really the option you want to go or anybody attending virtually, um, that's an option they want to go. You can reach out to me and I'm happy to send some resources on how to build your own. I've had to build a couple of them for museums. So, um, so that's kind of what I have to say about cameras versus scanners. I would say for the most part, scanners are a lot more approachable. Cameras um, are a lot more versatile because they can handle a little larger material, but they come with a much steeper learning curve in my opinion. So getting into kind of the resolution, bit, uh, bit depth, color, and eventually uh, file types. Um, you know, this is again, this is a, a table from the, the book Creating Family Archives uh, by Margot uh, Note. Um, these are her recommendations. Um, I would say some of these are pretty intense. Um, so, you know, when you view an image on a screen, um, that file is made of hundreds of small squares called pixels, in case you didn't know that. Um, so I'm sure plenty of you have maybe looked at a uh, photo online and zoom, 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 and eventually just turns into boxes. So that's the pixel, right? Pixels is just color dots or color squares. So um, when you're scanning, your resolution would refer to basically the number of pixels on the horizontal horizontal and vertical axis. And when you're scanning, this is where it can get kind of confusing for some people. When you scan, it's PPI, it's pixels per inch. <laughs> and when you're printing, it's DPI. So you will see them interchangeably used. We don't really print things. So I say PPI quite a lot, but if you're working with a printing company to print a photo or reproduce a map or whatever, they're gonna talk DPI, they're, they're interchangeable. It just, one is for printing, one is for scanning. So um, you're gonna see me kind of use them slightly interchangeably because I'd say it, 
I've always, I was always grew up with DPI. And when I got in the archive world, it was PPI when I worked on grants. So, um, so looking at PPI and scanning, the more pixels you have on the horizontal and vertical axis, the higher the resolution and the finer the detail in the image, right? In theory. Um, in the library world, we scan way higher than most of you ever need to think about, but we have the capacity to store these things because the higher resolution, the more intense you go, the bigger the file, the heavier it's gonna be, the more you have to put up in terms of cost to store this material. Digitization is an investment, it's not free. So not only are you buying the scanner, but you have to have a way of preserving it after you've done that, where you're gonna store it, how are you gonna store it? And we'll talk about at the end, um, kind of our recommendations for that. Um, so, you know, I would say for most family projects, um, unless you're doing some really intense stuff, um, you want to choose a resolution that really balances quality and a reasonable file size, right? Um, I've ripped scans using our equipment that comes up to gigabytes. Not everyone needs to be doing that um, because you start dealing with things that when I first started digitizing things, when I first came here and we did digitize things to the standards we were bringing them to, like, I'm pretty sure my computer smoked at the time. We, like, bought a nicer computer to handle it. But we bought, we have equipment to specifically handle that kind of projects. Um, so not everyone needs a scan super intense. You know, I would probably say, like, they're on the table. They're talking about negatives and slides and transparencies uh, being in the 3,000 PPI. I, you know, depending on what you really need to use it for, I think you could get away with anything around 12, personally. I think three three thousand can be a, a bit of an intense overkill. I, I would probably personally for our organization be looking at three thousand. Um, but people have done it to six hundred. If you're not looking to do anything too crazy, then that's by all means that's fine. Um, but if you're trying to go, I'm going to take all these negatives and I'm going to print them big, then maybe you need to be thinking about staying in that twelve number um, to mean to ensure that the print quality you get from it for you know from a negative that's two by two to uh, 20 by 30 inch thing format is going to have the, the highest quality um, to that. Um, so again, higher resolution, higher file size, you have to make decision. We've totally gone into projects and realized as we start scanning, we don't need to be scanning this high because of what it is. Um, you know, when we're dealing with negatives, we're shooting high, really high because we don't want to handle them again. Certain other materials like why are we scanning this letter at such high resolution? There's no reason we should be, there's no reason we need to be doing that because we have the physical material, we're an archive. It comes with who we are. Um, it should also be, um, you know, we made the comment of you could scan low, but you can't go high from that. So scan high and then you can rip a copy low from that. Um, you should also think about, um, as you're dealing with these materials, um, you know they're giving recommendations of color and, and bit rate, uh, bit rate and stuff like that, or bit depth. Sorry, um, and this is a nice table for that. Again, it's in the book. Um, there's a lot of materials out there. Um, you know, you don't need to be scanning black and white negatives in color. You're not catching color in it, so why um, do that? Um, you never want to scan in black and white. It's called grayscale and usually you're in an eight bit grayscale and I'll, I'll show you what that kind of looks like and why I say that in just a second. So we had the, co uh, the question about TIFF versus JPEG and why. So hopefully this is the example of why. So let's look at PPI and scan formatting for just a second here. The higher resolution, again, higher PPI you scan in theory, the finer the detail that you get from that material. Um, in terms of file format, there are three common. I've already mentioned them earlier on, JPEG, TIFF, PDF. Um, and so in that world, it's best to understand the two terms lossless and lossy. Lossless means um, it preserves the original data. It represents the image without compressing and therefore reducing the accuracy of the image. Um, so a lossless, so it loses not, it doesn't lose anything lossless is a TIFF. It's a different file format. It's going to be, there's no compression. Um, you're going to retain the most data and information in that file format. 
it's going to be a lot higher of a file. So if you took a, a TIFF at three, 300 PPI and a JPEG at 300 DP, uh, PPI, the TIFF is going to be a much larger file. But you're going to have a much cleaner image and there's going to be no compression and you're not going to get loss of data. When you scan in a JPEG, uh, which is known as a lossy file, it when you scan it, it actually discards most of the data. Quality is lost. Um, and, but again, the trade-off is it uses less storage. Why would you, well then Don, why would you use a JPEG over a TIFF? If you ever try to upload a TIFF to a Walgreens photo center, they will not take it. Like they don't want a file type like that. They are huge and can be quite large. And for some projects, you don't need to have a TIFF for it. On the flip side of that, I will say, my recommendation is that you scan at a TIFF and then you print off of a JPEG or, or share a JPEG. Um, we scan what would be known as a master file or master copy. So we would, in theory, for the example, we have a negative, we wanna scan it. We take the negative, it's a 35 millimeter slide. We're gonna go, okay, for the purposes of what we need it, we're gonna scan it at 2,400 2, PPI TIFF. Scan it, it's a really big file and we go, that photo is going to look really good on the wall, or that photo is going to look really good in this publication, or that photo is going to look really good in a display. We are not going to take a 2400 PPI TIFF and just put it into that format and put it on the wall. It's just not, it's too much data. So we go, okay, well, how big is the medium? What are we using it for? Is it a small publication in a book? Okay, well, then it just needs to be a 300, P, uh, 300 PPI JPEG. It does not need to be this intense file. Um, so if you had a look into our backends, typically we have the master copy and then on a separate folder would be the JPEGs. And the JPEGs is how we present our digital files on our, on our digital archive online. So does that answer your question? Okay, awesome. And, and that's something to think about going back to this slide. When you're looking at scanners or equipment, you want to make sure they do both. So, um, some cameras will actually shoot, like I when I used to do photography for museums and stuff like that, they can shoot in both. Um, I don't need to do that, but you could shoot both in TIFF and JPEG at the same time. Um, and so the TIFF, um, so when you're, but when you're looking at a scan or something like that, you wanna make sure there's a TIFF. You know, if I had to make a recommendation on a TIFF um, scanning flatbed scanner system, I would try to make sure that that flatbed scanner at minimum can scan up to 1200 TIFF. That would be my like anything lower than that. And like, you're gonna notice the difference eventually in my, in my opinion. Now I'm a digital specialist, so like I'm intense about it, but not everyone needs that again, but um, that would be what I would look for in a scanner is to make sure you can do that 1200 PPI in a TIFF format. Um, and most, I find most printers or most scanners can handle that for the most part. So um, getting back into like bit depth. So here's an example of bit depth. Um, hopefully this is big enough for you, for you in the live audience. Um, the far left is black and white. It's black and white, it's two colors, that's it. You're scanning black and white and that's it. Old scanners, old printers, that's what they did. Um, you know, why would you scan in black and white over grayscale? When in doubt, grayscale it. I wouldn't really pick black and white, um, some people would make the, kind of make the argument, like if you have a document, do you really need to have it in grayscale? You know, the farther left you go on this page, on the slide, the less data, the less memory, the less storage is required. And you know, middle photo is grayscale, so that's 256 colors. You have a much more dynamic range of representation in terms of color scale. It's all gray, but it's different shades of gray. Um, so, you know, again, the example I gave earlier, you have a, black and white negative, you don't need to scan it in color because you're going to pick up color. You're not going to pick up colors that it's supposed to pick up. You want to go to the grayscale. Usually what would be called an eight bit. Uh, there's different bits. The higher the number of bits, like eight, 24, 16, the higher number you get, the more color range it, it has. Um, so again, it's your call what you really need. But I would say most black and white mediums, um, if you're doing letters or something like that and you don't think you need to have it in color, because you want to save space, I just grayscale it, in my opinion. And then color, um, you know, you have a color negative, you have um, a letter that has some kind of 
important color representation on it, a flyer, a poster, a, a funeral book or whatever, you're going to start looking into 24 bit color um, slides on that or uh, color scans on it. Um, going into, um, we're just hitting 650 here. So I'll get, hey, um, I'll kind of start speeding through some of this because some of this gets a tiny bit technical and I don't want to make any of you fall asleep here. Uh, files and for folders. It's important to, before you start scanning, really think about how you want to understand how your digital objects are handled, right? Like if you just go, well, I'm going to scan everything and it's going to be image one, image two, image three, image four. And then you start another project five years later and you go, I'm image one, image two, image three. Well, they, they're in separate folders, Don, it doesn't matter. It's the same file name. You cannot put those two images of things. You're gonna lose track. I'm sorry, that's just, that is my opinion. Um, you're gonna lose track. This is an example of something we do. Um, so our stuff can kind of sometimes change on what we're working on. Um, for example, we don't need to we don't need to digitize um, like the example I have here on the whiteboard. I'll talk about in just a second. I would recommend that to a degree for for you all. For us, we don't need to do that structure because we have a digital archive we present things in. So we metadata on the back end, take all that in, crunch it all in, and represent it in a digital archive to handle it. So you know we know why we're doing it this way. We make that conscious decision. You know, to break it down, the AP stands for Alpina postcards. The 001 is it's the first scan. A means it's, it's the front of the postcard. B means it's the back of the postcard. So that's our code to ourselves. Um, so again, you can adopt that format. Um, you know, Timmy's sixth birthday, underscore 001. Timmy's sixth birthday, underscore 002. You can do that. That's fine. As long as it makes sense to you. Because the file type, you want to be short, sweet, and understandable. You don't want Timmy's sixth birthday at Cancun on this date with George, Sarah, and Stephen. Like, I've seen that stuff before. It's going to get crowded. It doesn't help you. Trust me. That's why metadata exists. You can add all that detail later, and we'll talk about that in just a slide. So, again, like the example I would give, you know, if you have a multimedia collection, you have letters, you have... Um, postcards, you have photos, you have negatives, all the things. You might have a structure to that collection. You might have already taken the time to create a structure. Again, the book, Creating Family Archives, is really great start to how to do that. Um, and so the example she gives is kind of what I have on the whiteboard here, which is she's matching the digital file and how to handle the digital file, very similar to how you would handle the physical collection. So for in her example, she has the main folder is what I would call is the collection folder. That is the, the main folder. That is the Smith family collection, right? So you would put something like Smith. And then underneath that, would I would call as a series folder. So within the Smith folder, the family folder would be correspondence. So anything in there would be correspondence. And then underneath that, you'd have, here's all the correspondence from 17, 1979. You could put 1979 underscore 1989. You don't have to be this ultra specific. Um, and then within that folder, you could have something like the date of that envelope or the date of that material. If there's a letter written on uh, January 5th of 1971, you would put that in some kind of, I would always put the dates first. It's how we do uh, when we scan newspapers. I always put TAN for the Alpina News. And then I put underscore, put the year first, the month second, the day last, and then the underscore. And then I usually put like either a quick comment or the title of the article, because then when I put everything up, it's all in order of how it transpired. And it's really helpful, helps me a lot. So that's kind of the recommendation they have. This is very intense. If you have 10 photos and that's all you're scanning, then ignore this. You don't need to do this. Um, but I would still recommend having some kind of, you know, you know, you could do a folder like, Smith family photos and underneath do like Tim's sixth birthday and then have the date or, you know, and then underneath that you'd have some kind of code that makes sense to you. And you just put, you know, you could put just the date and then underscore zero zero one. Um, I keep saying zero zero one because you don't want to do Smith underscore one Smith underscore two, because then you get the 10 and your computer's going to go, 
okay, well, Smith underscore one, Smith underscore 10. It's going to put it out of order. It's best is to do 001, 002. So you might need to think about, okay, I have more than 100. I have I have 1,000 photos that I'm going to scan. Kudos to you. You might need to think about adding another zero in. But if you have you know, less than a hundred and less than a thousand and you're in the three digit zone, just zero, zero, one suffices, zero, zero, two. It keeps everything in order. Um, I've personally made the mistakes of that in my early in my career and it's not something you want to do because it's a pain in the butt to fix. Um, but the big thing at the end of the day with these kind of projects is you really want to stay consistent. Once you decide to do a file naming or a structure, a folder structure, um, if it makes sense to you, stay consistent with it. Because if you start going, oh, well, you know what, I realize, you know, things change. You go through a project and you realize mm, that wasn't the most effective way to do it. It's better to go back and fix stuff than it is to just keep changing things, keep changing things and not correcting the old stuff because it just can get all over the place uh, very quickly. You also want to avoid um, when you're file naming or anything like that, don't put exclamation points and and sign, ampersands and stay away from any special characters. Keep it really simple. Don't use spaces, all underscores. Uh, some people say you can do hyphens. I don't use hyphens because we have software that won't read hyphens, but underscores. Um, I've also seen like people will put like the date. So like, for example, that, this gives an example of like the year underscore the month underscore the, the, the day underscore. When I do it, I don't put underscores between the dates. So mine would just read 1979-01-05 and then underscore what it is. Um, so you can make it much more simplistic if you want to. I, I find the simpler, the better um, when it comes to that kind of materials. Adding metadata, there's a lot of different softwares and depending on your comfort, comfortability with it, um, it's different ways you can go for it. Um, the most basic thing you can do is, let's say you have a PC, you scan an image, you go into it, um, you know, you basically pull up the properties on the item. Uh, it's, you know, there's the tabs on the top that go general security details, the previous version. You go to, you can go to details and then you have options like this is standard for all computers, title, subject, rating, tags, comments, authors, all that kind of stuff. That top bar underneath description is really where you want to spend some time if you have the time. Uh, so for example, title is not the file title. It's the title for that image. Um, so it could, that could be a variety of things. However, if you want to do it. Again, I kind of keep it short and sweet. I want to go over really complicated with the title. Uh, subject, think of it more of a keyword search. Like, let's say you're doing more of a genealogical focus type of scanning, and that's your mindset. Maybe putting the names in or putting um, places. They're in Arizona. They're in Florida. They're at Grace Lutheran Church. They're at, you know, all the different things. That's, I wouldn't go over. I'm The rule in the library world is don't go more than five. If you're going more than five, then it's just going to become cluttered. Um, so I would say stay the three to five subjects, um, key basically keywords. Um, and then uh, you can go to, I don't really deal with ratings and tags personally. Then you can go to comments. This is where you can be a little bit more rich. You can go, you know, this is a photo of Tim's sixth birthday that was held at, you know, the Alpena County Library in 1979 on this day, you know, on this date. And in the photo is a group shot of Tim with his parents, you know, Denise and Bob and the grandparents, Steve and Stacy. You know, that's where you can get more nuance. And why you want to do that is because if you try to search your images and you look up, oh, do I have any photos of Stacy? You can type in Stacy and it pulls it up. So you can search within within the folders or within that project and go pull it up. There are more intense projects. Um, like this is this is a screen grab from Adobe Bridge. Adobe Bridge, Lightroom, there's different softwares out there that you can use, um, but you can edit metadata within it. Um, but again, those are things that cost money. And I find for the most part, the file explorer is pretty easy to use. Now, if you're dealing with thousands of things, then yeah, maybe you need to think about taking some online courses or seminars or, or what have you that, that specialize in showing you how to do that software um, because it get pretty intense pretty quick. Um, but for the most part, the basics are still there, right? Like bicycle.jpg is not the best example, but it kind of shows the example of what you shouldn't do. Um, it's a JPEG. It's telling me that it's a JPEG file. Um, it was made through Adobe Photoshop Elements. Um, it was created back in 2007, 
2007. It was last modified in 2007. The file size, the dimensions, the dimensions in inches, which is always kind of nice, and the resolution, 900 PPI. Bit depth, it was scanned at 800. Um, color mode, RGP. That's telling me it was done in color, not um, grayscale. And then don't worry about color file. So, but you can get all this kind of metadata. For a lot of people, what you see on the screen is, is more intense than you ever really need to worry about. Um, but again, it illustrates with some of the more intense software, you can see a lot more and find a lot more materials. Um, so wrapping it up here, um, I wanted to end, you know, we've talked a lot about approaching digitization, doing digitization, how to do it, all that kind of fun stuff. So you've made all these scans, it's great. But I've heard so many times where people go, I had all those photos and everything else digitized on our external hard drive and it got stolen or it got hit by water and it's gone. That's where the three, two, one rule, this has got a step counter. It says you reached your goal. I'm like, I'm not walking. Um, the three, two, one rule is a, is a very standard rule in the world of digitization. Uh, it's just a really, it's a simple remind, uh, reminder. Basically it says, keep three complete copies of your information. Two of the copies should be on a varied media. So that could be cloud. That could be external hard drive. That could be a flash stick. That could be, there's very intense external hard drives. That could be two external hard drives. That could be two USB flash sticks. That could be two different cloud-based services. Um, and then one co uh, copy should be stored offsite. So what does that look like for the library? So for the library, what does that look like? It looks like, um, I have on my computer, we have, this is more intense. We have a cloud, internal cloud-based server. So I can access our computers and our department can access these that do photo editing. So we can all access them. So that's one storage that's in-house. We can all access that right from a computer. The second is the backup to that server system. And then the third, in theory, should be a further backup. And that should be it's not right now, we're working on it. That should be probably at my house, right? So an example for a family collection could be, um, I just finished the project. There's a copy of the project on your computer. There's a project of the copy on an external hard drive. And then there's another external hard drive with a copy that you keep at your cottage or you keep at your friend's house or you keep at your cousin's house or something like that. And you you just update those. When you when you finish your project or you're in the middle of the project and you're ready to do updates, you just grab it, you update all three of them, and then you chuck them back out. Um, so that's what the three, two, one rule is. Um, it's really, my thing is it's really important to do that because you're gonna get hit by viruses, malware, eventually on someone's computer. So why not have the insurance policy of making sure that if you lose it, digitally speaking, or it gets damaged physically or stolen or whatever, um, you know, again, I've had friends that have gotten their laptop stolen and that was like the only photos they had of the grandparents and it's gone. Like that, that's it. They never get back. So it's kind of a, a bit of a hard lesson to learn, but the three, two, one is really easy to remember. Um, and it's a pretty fairly fail safe. Now, again, you do the external hard drive. That doesn't mean that it's good for 10 years. You need to think about making sure you get new hard drives, you know, did as when you make digitization efforts, uh, you're making a commitment to keeping it fresh. So it could be that JPEGs in three years could be fairly obsolete and now it's JPEG 2000. So you need to think about, you know, that's where the TIFFs kind of come into play a little bit because the TIFFs are pretty bulletproof in theory. Um, but there's always new equipment coming out there. There's always new types of hard drives. They're getting cheaper. They're getting bigger. Uh, you know, five years ago, think about what you had in your flash stick versus now. It's massive difference. Um, so things to think about, you know, we have a, technically our policy is a five year, our external hard drives after five years are supposed to be replaced out and then we update them. Um, that's technically the rule. Now there's definitely hard drives that have existed longer than that. And they're fine in theory. There are ways to check the integrity of them, but that's getting way too deep into the weeds for this, for uh, the purposes of this. So that would be my recommendation and, and kind of how I end the, the presentation of, of how to handle digitization materials. So thank you so much for being here in person or vi virtually. Um, are there any questions? Yes. What about cloud storage? So cloud storage, yeah, that wasn't something I quite talk, touched on here. Are you talking about like cloud storage in terms of like 
different vendors that are out there for cloud storage or just in general? Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, yeah, and I, I think to some degree that's where the three, two, one rule comes into play with cloud storage. So if you use cloud storage, we don't use cloud storage because we do it or we technically kind of do it ourselves. So we don't need to rely on something like Amazon and a couple of Google and a couple of different entities do do more commercial grade stuff that would be more tailored to us. Um, but, you know, you could use Google Drive as a cloud storage and they are, you know, fairly safe. You know, um, there really isn't too many examples of stuff getting stolen. I, I'm also like, some people be like, well, you put it on the cloud. What if it gets out there? I'm like, photos of my grandfather in 1962 isn't really going to cause scandal for me. So I'm not really worried about it. Um, but those major companies have some pretty serious security systems in the first place and a lot of retention policy and, and stay in power. So if you look at cloud software, really weigh who the company is, do your homework, you know, look at, you know, you can literally Google search, is Google Chrome, is Google Drive safe? Uh, is Google Chrome good, or Google, I keep using Chrome, sorry. Google Drive, good for family collections. A lot of people I know use Amazon or Google, like these major companies. If you start getting into these weird companies, you're like, I have no idea who that is. Maybe do a little bit of research or if sometimes like the deal's too good to be true, then it's probably too good to be true. Um, so that would be my recommendation, but I would never solely rely on just cloud software to be your backup. I would have bare minimum, I'd have copy on your computer as well. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. But yeah, that would be my um, recommendation with cloud software storage. So, yep. They were in in fireproof safe. Yeah. In the World Trade Center. Yeah. And they're on yeah, they're the gone. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And. Uh, yeah, that example would kind of illustrate, you know, it's an extreme example, but, you know, house fire, you know, for the everyday person, a house fire, flooding in the, ba you know, a lot of people like to put that stuff in the basement. I don't recommend it. Um, a flooding in the basement, uh, fire in the attic, uh, mold, whatever, you know, all those things can kind of destroy that. And so you really want to use that three, two, one rule to ensure that you're preserving it the best. And that's where the, that's where the, the one part comes in, storing it off site. Um, and that's usually where most people fail. You know, we're all human. I'm not here to judge anyone, but uh, if you have that option to keep it at a second location, uh, some people will use cloud so this cloud storage as the offsite location. I don't have anything against that. Um, I guess it comes down to what works out best for you, but I would probably argue the most bulletproof is having a physical external hard drive type storage type uh, situation off site is probably your most kind of bulletproof. So, like for us, you know, we have that example in house, but for our digital archive, the things that we've actually uploaded, our company that is our vendor in Canada has their own back physical backups and cloud backups that they have. So, they have their contingencies to ensure that our database doesn't just go poof at night. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, that's a great example though. Cool. Well, again, thank you. That's my contact information. Don't be afraid to contact me and give me a phone call if you have any questions or follow up to this. Um, or if you're getting started in your project and you're, you're still not quite confident with what you're going to do, always happy to chat about this and, and talk to you about your worries or, or at least shoot you into different resources that might be available to you. Um, for those that are here in person, let me stop this.